This is Larry Moore. I'd like to welcome you back to our biological wastewater treatment training series. Today we'll be doing our third presentation and we'll be talking about activated sludge microbiology. Uh, very important that we understand the microorganisms if we're going to understand biological wastewater treatment. Uh, here we see a micro uh, graph of, uh, of the microorganisms uh, under a microscope. And we see clumps of bacteria, and then we see some hair-like uh, features uh, sticking out from the flock in the middle. Those hair-like structures are filaments, uh, but the flock is the uh, brownish material, uh, irregular shaped material that you see throughout the screen. But just for an outline of what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about bacteria. Bacteria are most important microorganisms in the activated sludge process. They comprise about 95% of our biomass. And then we have protozoans and metazoans. They are higher organisms and they have an important role as well that we'll talk about later. Uh, they only comprise about 5% of the biomass, but again, they're important in the activated sludge food chain. And we'll talk a little bit about the distribution of microorganisms over time uh, and then we'll look at the various growth phases of the microorganisms in the activated sludge process. So when you look under a microscope and you look at a, just a single drop of mixed liquor, mixed liquor being the contents of our biological reactor, we're going to see uh, clumps of bacteria. Uh, you see the bacterial flock, large flock in the center of the slide there. And then you see some filamentous organisms, the hair-like structures, and then there's some protozoa as well. But we have a, a wide variety of microorganisms and they work together to uh, give us an, a, a treatment process that performs well and produces uh, very, excellent out, uh, very excellent effluent quality. We have different types of, of bacteria. We have flock forming bacteria, uh, those bacteria are obviously very important to us because these bacteria will uh, clump together and form flocks. Uh, but we also have to have a little bit of the filamentous bacteria, the second category there. And the filaments, they provide a structure or a backbone for the good flock formers to develop around and give us structural integrity of the flock. But if we get too many filaments, as we talk about later, then we may have settleability or, or foaming problems. We'll talk about uh, heterotrophic and autotrophic bacteria. Heterotrophic are, are predominant organisms in activated sludge, but if we're going to oxidize ammonia through the nitrification process, we'll be depending on the autotrophic bacteria. And then we'll talk about mode of metabolism, aerobic metabolism, anaerobic metabolism, and facultative metabolism. We will, as a design engineer and use the operator, will actually control the process to achieve the desired metabolism that we want in, in the biological reactor. As I mentioned earlier, about 95% of our biomass are bacteria. And the bacteria under ideal conditions, they can reproduce uh, uh, about every 20 minutes. And so they readily uh, multiply and, and dominate the uh, biomass. The flock is formed as the bacterial cells clump together. There may be thousands and thousands of bacteria in a uh, bacterial flock. And the reason the bacteria are able to clump together, adhere to one another, is because they release a polysaccharide slime that provides natural bioflocculation. That's very important in activated sludge. Well, when we talk about the bacteria, they're trying in the activated sludge process or in nature, they wanna eat and enjoy life like we do as human beings. So they, they wanna eat and uh, have a, a source of carbon, source of energy in order to survive. But there are several mechanisms that they use to actually utilize their food source. If we have particulate organic matter in the wastewater, which we will, it'll, it can be colloidal or larger suspended solids, but even the colloidal solids, those solids, organic solids, would ad, will adhere 
to the outside of the bacterial cell wall. And they're too large to pass through the cell wall and the cell membrane to be used for food. So extracellular enzymes, they on the outside of the cell wall, they'll break down these particulate organics and make them small enough so they can diffuse through the cell wall and be used for food. And we call that exocellular digestion. And if we have dissolved organics in the wastewater, which we will, some of the organics will be in uh, solution and the nutrients generally will be in solution, then they will readily move across the cell wall and cell membrane and be absorbed into the cell and used for growth, reproduction, and energy. Well, let's look at the heterotrophic and autotrophic bacteria. They differ in, in the type of nutrition they require. Let's talk first about uh, these nutritional requirements. Most microorganisms have three essential nutritional requirements, and you see them here. A source of carbon, a source of energy, and a terminal electron acceptor. And so we're going to look at these very important because this has to do with the, again, the nutrition uh, that's needed by the microorganisms. So heterotrophic bacteria, they use organic carbon as their carbon source. They oxidize organic material to generate energy to keep them alive. And most heterotrophic bacteria are facultative. That is, they can operate in the aerobic mode, they can operate in the anoxic mode, and they can op operate in the anaerobic mode. And again, we will manipulate the biological reactor to achieve the desired metabolism. So the heterotrophic bacteria, some of them are actually obligate aerobes. They can only survive in the presence of dissolved oxygen. Some bac heterotrophic bacteria, obligate anaerobes, they can only survive in the absence of molecular oxygen, call those obligate anaerobes. But again, most heterotrophic bacteria in nature in the activated sludge process are facultative organisms. They prefer dissolved oxygen and they prefer to operate in the aerobic mode. But if we take their oxygen away and they have access to nitrite or nitrate nitrogen, they will operate in the anoxic mode. If we take away their oxygen, their nitrite and nitrate, then they'll operate in their third preferred mode of operation and that's anaerobic metabolism. The autotrophic bacteria, their carbon source is carbon dioxide. So they use inorganic carbon to, uh, uh, to obtain their carbon. And they generate energy by oxidation reduction reactions involving inorganic compounds. And most autotrophic bacteria are obligate aerobes. So we look at, uh, again, a micrograph here uh, of the um, solids in the microscope. And we can see that we have uh, clumps of bacteria, and according to this slide, we have three different shapes of bacteria. Uh, bacteria can be rod-shaped, they can be spiral, or they can be spherical. And we'll have different types of bacteria that we'll use in the activated sludge process again, and we'll typically see all of these in the process. Again, if we look under the slide on the microscope, we're not going to see individual bacteria. Again, we'll see clumps of bacteria. Well, how do bacteria reproduce? Well, most bacteria reproduce by binary fission. That is, after a period of time, they'll form a septum, and then they'll actually divide and, and separate into two daughter cells. We call that binary fission. And when conditions are ideal for our bacteria, they may reproduce and divide and produce two daughter cells in about 20 minutes or so. We mentioned earlier the filamentous bacteria. Uh, as I said before, they're good in that they provide a backbone. They provide a structure for the good flock forming bacteria to form around. And the analogy would be the human body. If we didn't have a skeleton to hold all of our organic mass together, then we would just be a, a clump of uh, organic matter laying on the floor. So the skeleton is very important because it provides structural integrity for our bodies. 
Well, the filamentous bacteria provide structural integrity for the biological flock. Nevertheless, we can get too many filaments. If we get too many filaments in the activated sludge process, our sludge may not settle in the final clarifier, or we may have foaming in the aeration basin and foaming in the effluent. So if we get too many filaments, it can be really a huge problem that we'll have to overcome in the activated sludge process. Extended aeration activated sludge uh, plants uh, can grow filaments rather easily. So when we're operating extended aeration activated sludge or analyzing it, we need to be aware of that. Sequencing batch reactors or batch activated sludge generally do not have uh, as big a problem with filamentous organisms. But the filamentous bacteria will thrive and, and become too numerous and create problems for us if conditions are favorable to their growth. And some of the conditions that will stimulate the growth of these filamentous organisms are low dissolved oxygen, septicity, low pH, old sludge, nutrient deficiency. So those things uh, are, that we need to avoid in the activated sludge process, uh, if we can uh, do that. So again, another look at the micrograph of the bacteria, and we see, uh, again, clumps of bacteria. Uh, and then we also see these filamentous organisms that, uh, we said, provide flock structure. But it's very important that we uh, recognize, again, the type of organisms that we have. As, as I said, small amounts of filament strengthen the, the structure, uh, and large amounts can adversely affect process performance. A general rule is if we have more than about 10 to 20 filaments per block, then we're beginning, we're beginning to have too many filaments and we may see settleability issues in our final clarifier. A term that we're, we use a lot in activated sludge is mixed liquor suspended solids and mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. Again, the mixed liquor is the content, contents of the biological reactor. The suspended solids in the mixed liquor is the mixed liquor suspended solids, but a better measure of the organic content or a better measure of the biomass in the reactor is the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. The organic fraction is a better, better indicator of the microorganisms. We have another term that we calculate occasionally, and that's called the food to microorganism ratio. In wastewater treatment, most design engineers will use BOD5, biochemical oxygen, man, over five days. That is the measure of the organic matter. That is the food for the bacteria. And so when we talk about food to microorganism ratio, it's uh, the pounds of BOD5 applied per day to the reactor per pound of MLVSS in the reactor. We call that the F over M ratio. And for conventional activated sludge, it'll normally be between 0.2 and 0.6. Another term that we'll use a lot as we talk about activated sludge is sludge age. But there are different terms for sludge age. MCRT, SRT, or other terms that are used to uh, represent sludge age. So it's kind of like saying soft drink, soda pop, Coke, will basically mean the same thing. So if I say mean, mean cell residence time or solids retention time or sludge age, I'm saying exactly the same thing. Again, it's about how long in days the biomass stays in the activated sludge process until it exits as solids in the waste sludge or it exits as suspended solids in the effluent. We call the solids that go out in the waste sludge intentional wastage, and we call the suspended solids that escape over the clarifier effluent weir unintentional wastage. But again, that's how solids leave the system. So the sludge age or MCRT or SRT is the solids inventory in the system divided by the solids leaving the system per day. And thing we have to remember is F over M ratio and sludge age are inversely related. At high food to microorganism ratios, we'll have a, a fairly low sludge age. If we're operating at an F over M of about one, our sludge age may only be three or four days. 
if we're operating at a moderate F over M, 0.2 to 0.6, our sludge age would typically be five to 15 days. If we're operating in the extended aeration mode, our F over M ratio might be 0.05 to 0.15, and the sludge age may be 20 to 40 days. But these are important design and operating parameters that we have to be aware of. Here's your picture again of the activated sludge process. We have the reactor on the left and the secondary clarifier on the right. We have to look at this as an integrated system. We have to have the biological reactor and we have to have the secondary clarifier in, in order for the process to work well. And sometimes we get too focused on what's happening in the biological reactor and sometimes forget about what happens in the secondary clarifier. But most of the problems we have in activated sludge are related to poor settleability in the secondary clarifier. So we have to look at it as an entire system. The raw wastewater comes in to the biological reactor, the return sludge from the bottom of the clarifier is brought back around. That allows us to maintain an adequate biomass inventory in the reactor. And then the influent flow rate plus the return rate, that's the flow going to the secondary clarifier. And then the influent flow minus the waste sludge flow will go out into the effluent. And then the return sludge will go back again to the biological reactor. So we need to keep that in mind. We talk about uh, the microorganisms and understand this is the process uh, in which we're considering their uh, performance. We talk about the higher organisms, the protozoans are one type of higher organism. And again, they're very important to us because they feed on particulate organic matter and they also feed on the bacteria to keep the bacteria in check and help maintain a healthy population of bacteria in the system. And we have amoeba, we have um, Flagellates, we have different types of protozoa that are in the activated sludge process. And the amoeba are single cell uh, protozoa and they move very slowly in search of food. The flagellates, they're about five times larger than bacteria and they propel themselves with flagella, which is a hair-like uh, structure that they use to move around. Then we have free swimming organisms, the bulk liquid free swimmers. They, they move around very quickly. They have high energy requirements and they generally are gonna be present in large numbers if we're operating at a very high organic loading. The crawlers crawl over and around the biological flock. The carnivores, they feed on uh, the bacteria and also feed on amoeba, flagellates, and free and stalk ciliates as well. And the stalk ciliates uh, are important because generally if we have a good settling act activated sludge, we will normally have a good population of stalk ciliates in the mixed liquor. So on the left, we have a picture of a flagellate. Again, you can see the flagella uh, coming out from the uh, main body of the organism. And again, the flagella will be whipped around so that the flagellate can move around and find food in the activated sludge mixed liquor. Then we have our stalk ciliates. And again, an abundance of them usually is a good indicator that we have a good settling sludge. And then euglena is another type of protozoa that we have in the activated sludge process. Uh, most protozoa are in the size range of five to 500 microns in size. So they're much larger than our uh, bacteria. And, and again, they're very important because they maintain a good healthy population of bacteria by feeding on the bacteria and by also feeding on particulate organic matter. The ciliates, we have free swimming ciliates. Uh, paramecium is a, uh, is a popular type of uh, free swimming ciliate that again, usually are indicative of a good settling sludge. And then our stalk ciliates, um, you can see their body and then at the head, uh, they'll have cilia that go round and round and they'll use the cilia to help them move around on that stalk and also to pull particulate organic matter into their body to be used as food. 
And then protozoans, again, they have internal digestive systems. They're single-celled organisms, but they have internal digestion systems that when they pull the particular organic matter into their bodies, they can digest it and use it for uh, growth and energy. Amoeba, another type of organism uh, or protozoan that we see in activated sludge. They have irregular finger-like projections or false feet, and they can also use a slime layer to help move about in the flock to obtain their food. And then a specific type of amoeba, testate amoeba, they actually form a test or a shell around themselves that allows them to uh, protect themselves against predators. Also have the euglena. And again, they have hair-like structures uh, called flagella. Again, that they whip around one or more of these uh, flagella that they use to move around to uh, find food in the mixed liquor. Metazoans are, are higher organisms. Metazoans are complex animals. So protozoa uh, are single-celled animals. Metazoans are multi-celled animals. They're more complex. They're, they grow more slowly and they're more common in older sludges, more common in extended aeration activated sludge processes. But you can see that's a, pro, that's a, a rotifer right there, one of our common types of metazoans. But other types uh, besides the rotor for nematodes, roundworm, tardigrade, water bear, um, allosoma worm, those are uh, rotifers are common in extended aeration activated sludge as well as uh, nematodes, tardigrades, or annelids. They can be seen in extended aeration activated sludge process as well. The last four are, are not important. They're rare in activated sludge, but they're typically found in lagoon systems. Rotifers, again, very important. They, they swim around. Uh, some of them have a single head. Some of them have a double head. Um, they remind me of my Norelco triple header electric razor. Uh, when I turn it on, I have three rotating heads that help me shave. Well, these rotifers, they usually have one or two rotating heads that have cilia that are moving round and round. And these rotifers will swim around in the mixed liquor and you see them swimming among clumps of bacteria, bacterial flock there, and you can actually see them use their head to pull in these bacterial flocks and use that as a source of food. We also have nematodes. Again, these are more prevalent. Uh, we can see these occasionally in extended aeration activated sludge. Uh, they're aquatic worms. They're fast moving. You see them poking around the flock looking for food. And they're older organisms that, again, reproduce very slowly. Now, water bears, we don't see those uh, very often, but um, they would be present in extended aeration activated sludge processes, uh, oxidation ditches, sequencing batch reactors, very lowly uh, loaded or, uh, organically uh, and, and operating at a real long sludge age where we have very low organic content on the system. But again, water bears, they feed on small protozoa and uh, they do not like ammonia and uh, ammonia is very toxic to the water bears. Fungi are not important to activated sludge. Uh, they can be present if they are, uh, usually indicates we may have some issues. Uh, normally fungi will uh, be a problem if the pH drops too low in the mixed liquor, but ordinarily fungi uh, will be present very low levels in activated sludge. Algae are not important in activated sludge. Uh, they're important in uh, facultative lagoons, but in activated sludge clarifiers, they can create problems for us by growing on our effluent weirs and uh, have to be cleaned off on a regular basis because they form a biological slime on our secondary clarifier effluent weirs. Talk a little bit about the distribution of microorganisms over time. Uh, this is an important graph here. And as we look at time on the X axis, we can think of that in terms of sludge age or MCRT or SRT, how old the biomass is in days. Over on the left, we would be operating at a very low sludge age or very high food to microorganism loading. 
and we would have a predominance of zooflagellates or phytoflagellates. We don't normally oct uh, operate the activated sludge process in this range because we get a poor settling sludge and there's too much organic matter in the system. Our effluent quality will be poor. We'll have high BOD and high suspended solids in the effluent and we generally do not operate uh, in, in, in sludge ages of around one to two days and a real high FM ratio. But then as we move to the right, you'll see we get a, a, a much more predominance of bacteria, free swimming ciliates. And um, again, at moderate sludge ages, maybe around 10 to 15 days, we begin to see the stalk ciliates and rotifers come into predominance. Uh, but again, our primary organisms are the bacteria. And as we continue and, and on, on to the right and we get out into what we call the extended aeration activated sludge mode where we're in a sludge age of 20 to 40 days and the F over M ratio is maybe 0.05 to 0.1. Again, most of the organic matter has been removed from the system. The bacteria are starving. They begin to feed off their own protoplasm. We call that endogenous respiration we may get a pinpoint flock that settles more slowly, but we can overcome that by being more conservative in the design of our secondary clarifiers following extended aeration activated sludge. Let's look at the phases of growth in uh, biological treatment. If we were to take a, a, a beaker of uh, influent wastewater and we were to add, say, 100 or 200 milliliters of sludge to it, and we measured the microorganism concentration over time, we would get a, a growth curve that you see represented by the blue curve in the diagram. And initially, the microorganisms are getting acclimated to their environment, and then we get into the exponential growth phase. And in this phase, there's plenty of food to go around. Uh, the bacteria are reproducing at a rapid rate, but again, we typically don't operate the activated sludge in the exponential growth phase because again, we get poor settling sludge and there's too much organic matter in the system and in the effluent. As we move along the growth curve with time, again, food becomes uh, less available and, and uh, we start to see the bacteria, uh, the growth weight actually falling off a little bit. We call this a declining growth phase. Uh, and generally, this is where we get our best settling activated sludge. Uh, time for the bacteria to reproduce is actually increasing. Their growth rate, again, it has declined, but generally we'll get a good distribution of microorganisms and probably our best settling sludge. As we continue to make the sludge older, and get out into uh, extended aeration activated sludge, you get into what we call endogenous decay. In this range, most of the food, most of the food has been used up. And again, the microorganisms are feeding on themselves, we call that endogenous respiration. They oxidize their own protoplasm to, and use it to generate energy to keep themselves alive. And you and I will do that as well. If we go uh, a day or two without food, uh, then we're going to basically kick our metabolism into endogenous metabolism, and we're going to start to utilize our stored uh, organic material, stored fat in our bodies, and burn it up to actually generate energy because we're not taking in uh, food as we normally do. In the exponential growth range, again, we, uh, we're going to have the bacteria growing at a rapid rate, plenty of food available. There's not overcrowding. Conditions for growth are ideal. But again, we get a poor settling sludge and there's too much organic matter in the system. In declining growth, uh, again, the system produces better settling sludge, will produce an effluent quality that uh, will be very acceptable and generally be less than 20 milligram per liter suspended solids less than 20 milligrams per liter uh, BOD5 in the effluent. And then the final phase, endogenous decay again, or extended aeration activated sludge. Our settleability won't be quite as good, but 
will produce our best quality effluent because the soluble BOD in the system will be at its lowest. The soluble BOD5 in the effluent uh, in the endogenous decay range will be only one to two milligrams per liter. So if we design our clarifiers uh, conservatively and overcome the pinpoint flock that we have, which we can do, then we'll produce a very high quality effluent. So as we uh, look back at where we operate on the activated sludge process, you see the yellow uh, ellipse there. It's a little bit tight. I, if I had drawn it, I would make it extend further to the left and further to the right. We generally will operate the activated sludge process in the declining growth phase uh, or endogenous phase. And that's where we get our best settling sludge and our best effluent quality. So again, that's a little bit about the microorganisms that we have in activated sludge, and we have to understand them and how they operate, and it's our job as design engineers and as wastewater operators to try to manipulate the process to achieve the desired metabolism and produce a high-quality effluent. So if you have questions about today's presentation, you can contact me or you can get a hold of Tom Winning. And we'll be glad to hear your comments or questions. So I hope you have a great day. Thanks for participating today.